Welcome to my podcast, Today's Dream, Tomorrow's Reality. My name is Vicki Poole. I'm a master transformational coach and hypnotist specializing in habit change. And this podcast is sponsored by The Enlightened Peach. And it's all about embracing our mosaic life. Well, some of you may ask, what is a mosaic life anyway? Well, it is recognizing that all the pieces of our life, the good, the bad, the indifferent, have all come together to make us who we are. Change any one thing and we are different. With that in mind, I invite you to embrace your perceived imperfections and celebrate who you are. This podcast is unedited and raw, just like live. And I am your host. And today I have an amazing guest for you that I will bring out in just a moment. But before I do, I want to remind you to please leave a comment and remember to like, subscribe, share, do me a solid. We want to get this out so that all my amazing guests can have an even bigger platform to speak on. And that happens with you. So now, Let's get started. All right. So this lovely lady here is Nikki Green, and I'm super excited to have her on here. She has her own podcast, and it's called Stand Up and Stand Out, which I'm going to be on um, later on. So I'm really excited about that. But Nikki um, lives in Chicago, and I just met her through... Um, actually StreamYard, I believe it was, and we just connected and we've had a conversation and I just loved hearing what all she had to say. And I can't wait to, to dive in to her life and what all she's got going on. If you want to, Nikki, go ahead and introduce yourself and then we'll just start from there. And then we'll run with it. Thanks then so much for having me. <laughs> exactly. Vicky, it's so good to see you again. It's so amazing with these podcasts, like how like quickly we connect with each other and we really resonate. And, and I just love that. So I'm excited to have you on my show as well. Thank you for having me here. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Nikki Green, and I'm a life and business resiliency expert. Very topical for this show. Um, we really talk about how do we sustain life? How do we build mental resilience and keep going no matter how many challenges come our way? So it's super fun. And and uh, I, once I met Vicky, I was like, oh, yeah, we're we're going to be good friends. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because, you know, sometimes you meet someone and and what's what's interesting to me is before COVID, it was usually an in-person meeting. There wasn't so much of this. Right. And um, so if there's anything good that came from it, these kinds of things came from it for sure. Right. And um, so I really felt a connection from you very quickly. And so I was I was so stoked that you agreed to be on the podcast. Now, um, before we really get into what it is that you do, let's talk about where you came from. So tell me a little bit about your life. What was it in your life that led you to this path of creating this amazing podcast? And I just love that picture behind you. What is that? Is that a fish? Uh, so this is my chameleon. Um, this okay. wonderful thing is a gift from my family. So when I left my corporate job and began building my business, my brother designed my logo. He's a very talented uh, landscape architect in Indiana. And um, for Christmas, my family gave me this. It's actually made out of wood. It's carved and, and colored. Um, and I just thought it's so cool. And everybody kind of jokes it's my presidential seal sitting behind me. With the curtain. <laughs> that works for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, I have a really um, kind of incredible story behind the scenes of how I got here. And it's really strange because a lot of people actually resonate with the story, even though theirs is slightly different. But I grew up in a blended family with six different parents, and they were living across three states, which meant then I changed schools pretty much every six different parents. No, no. You got to <laughs> welcome to the 70s. Trying, trying to figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> we got to do the math. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can see yeah, four, so I, but where did the other two come from? Well, you know, it was the 70s. Everyone was having a good time, but people weren't quite with the people they were supposed to be with when they had the kids. The good part is they did embrace that spirit of love and they continued to still stay as a family, even though we were all kind of living different and very separate lives, including being across three different states. <laughs> wow. Wow. 
Yeah. And that meant too, I also changed schools a lot. So up until like the years through high school, I went to nine different schools. So I was always kind of the new kid. I was always jumping into a new environment and it meant that I had to adapt quickly to understand, you know, where we were at in school. Was I below? Was I ahead? Was I like nowhere to be found? Yeah. Um, and so it was always a very interesting environment, which leads me to where I am today is teaching other people how to adapt to change quickly when it comes in their life. So let me ask you this, because um, I didn't have the blended family like that, you know, but when I was a kid, because I'm probably older than you, um, you didn't have to live in the district, school district that you went to school in. And so if we changed babysitters or something like that, our school was changed. So by the time I got to high school, I had been in seven different schools. Um, but I'll be honest, to me, I loved it. I loved being the new kid because you get more attention. People want to talk to you. They want to, you know, I didn't have any of that stuff that I see in the movies and all, you know, where they, you know, they, they can't talk to people or they get shoved in the lockers. And I didn't experience any of that, but I loved being the new person because I got to reinvent myself every single time. And, you know, so um, I'm just curious, you know, as you were going through that, did you embrace that or was that something that was a kind of difficult for you? Yeah, I, it had mixed results. It depended on the school and the environment. Um, when I was younger, I went to private school. So it was pretty small, you know, not huge classes, not a ton of students and a very different approach to learning and, and the focus. And for me, I loved school. So for me, I didn't really care who was around. I was like, learn, yes, raise my hand, be in front of the class. You know, I'm a very extroverty, extrovert type person. I could see with other kids, maybe being a little more introverted might be challenging to have that, that type of change. And then when I started going to private school, that was from private school to public school, that was kind of the first big transition it was like, ooh, this is kind of different. And man, there's a lot more kids here and a lot more different types of kids because they don't have the same religion or, or culture or things. And so getting immersed in that was fascinating to me. And I really wanted to understand more about people's backgrounds. And I was asking a lot about them to learn. And then it got to a point where I was in a school where I wasn't welcome. They did not agree with my culture being mixed with theirs. And I experienced a lot of bullying and wow. ostracized. And so that was very difficult and then set me on a path of becoming more introverted through the next couple of schools because I had had such a bad experience during middle school, which is always kind of a tough time for kids. Yeah. So this is where I can say it can go any different way, right? You never know. It's kind of luck of the draw sometimes as to what situation you get put in and how people react to you at that point. And my super extroverty thing did not fly at that school. It was a school where definitely you keep your head down, you keep to yourself and, you know, you do your business. So. Oh, wow. 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 Well, I guess I'm very lucky that I didn't have that experience, you know, and I never went to and I didn't have an adjustment period because I was always in public school. So I'm sure because I have some clients that, you know, their children either went from public to private or private to public. And I will say that they talk a little bit about how difficult that transition thing is. Yeah. Yeah. So then you uh, you managed to I uh, have a stiff upper lip, I guess, and um, and keep going. So what happened then? Yeah. So, you know, for me, school was still the most important thing. And I knew that no matter what the situation was, the best answer for me was to go and be really good at school and do the things that I really loved doing so that I could go on to university. I could go travel the world. I could, you know, go and explore and see even more places than I had already seen. And that really did a wonderful thing for me. And so then during university, I left and went to Paris for a while and I went to school and just really started to explore and realizing how I was a leader and and that because of all of this change even at the age of 18 I was leading people much older than me and I was just much more confident in being Maybe able to with what just around the city going to explore uh, speaking the language just being able to just really put myself out there in situations that were extremely uncomfortable in a whole nother country I'd never been to before yeah yeah well that's probably where that extrovert thing comes in right <laughs> yeah, it, it all starts to come full circle. And, and it's really great when these little bits of yourself that you're starting to build when you're younger start to come together as an adult. And you're like, yeah, 
this, this is me. And, and you build that confidence. And that was such a great time in my life, I think, is really starting to kind of step into my own. And after that, I started working in Silicon Valley and then continued, you know, the trajectory in my career from there. Okay, well, cool. So I want to go back to those uh, those six parents. <laughs> Everybody <fascinated>. always does. <laughs> I'm fascinated with that. Um, so that was three moms and three dads. Yeah. So um, my mom was basically a single mom. My biological father left. He was gone for the first ten years of my life. I basically didn't see him. Didn't know where he was. Um, Did you then. Know who he was? Uh, I knew who he was. Occasionally he would write, you know, it's way before cell phones and all those things. So, you know, communication is a little bit slower and different. Um, and then um, my brother was born when I was four. So his dad came into the picture and that was, you know, sort of temporary and it was nice. You know, we were kind of a good family, but not really long term. And then he went to go to school to, you know, get a degree so that he could better help us. And he ended up meeting my stepmother. <laughs> <laughs> the best laid plans, you yeah, know, kind of right. end up. But it was the person he was supposed to be with. And I talk about this in my first book, I Laugh in the Face of Danger, of that I got to see my parents fall in love. I never really experienced them breaking up because many of these things happened when I was so little and they weren't really fighting in those types of things around me. It was just sort of like, okay, this is what's coming next. Mm -hmm. And, and my stepmom was so loving and so kind and so generous. And, you know, she was always just a second mother to me right from the very start, you know, even when they were How just were dating. Uh, I would have been about five or six. Okay. Yeah. Probably about that point. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's, that's a pretty good age to be able to still adapt to everything very easily. It's when they get a little bit older, it's a little harder. Um, <laughs> and uh, so now I have a question. The, Go um, for it. <laughs> <laughs> so your stepmom is there. So that is, that makes four. So where did the other two come from? So then my mother fell in love and she okay. found the man of her dreams. And it was, again, so wonderful to just see her so happy. And, you know, we were really struggling being now a single mom with two kids and kind of two absent fathers. Right. Um, it was really challenging for her. And I, I really got to see her blossom, really got to see her be very happy. And at that point, I'm six to seven. Um, we were living in Reno, Nevada at the time, and my stepdad was in California. And so we made the choice that was one of our big first moves. So we left Nevada and went there and my brother's father stayed, but my brother came with us. So this is where we're now kind of two states apart between California and Nevada. And it worked for a while. We kind of still went back and forth, even though my brother's dad is biologically not my dad. He was never married to my mother. Again, just very open and loving and that they I was always welcome in their house. And I was always a part of the family, not just with them, but, you know, the entire extended family. So. Perfect. So do you have any other siblings or just the brother? Oh yeah, they start keeping going. <laughs> I was thinking so, there's a lot of loving going on there. There might be more yeah, children. <laughs> exactly. So then my biological father returns when I'm about nine, ten, with a new uh, bride in tow and a whole bunch of stepkids along the way. Oh, wow. So um, her marrying my father was her second marriage. She already had four kids, um, and so it was like a whole family came along with that as well as a new dad that I really haven't met before. <laughs> wow. That's, that's pretty cool. That's really cool. You know, but I've just got a question. Um, you know, that's, that's a lot for a young child that age to decipher all these different things of going on and putting, cause we, as children, we want to kind of label, you know, this is what this is and this is what that means. And so I'll just share real quick, one little story that made, makes me think about this and it's, it's a little different, but for some reason it seems to fit to me, but I have my, my sister when, um, I don't remember how old she was, but she was she was an adult with an adult child and a grandchild. OK, and um, she had been divorced for a very long time, said she was never going to get married again. Well, my my niece, her daughter was dating a guy and they kept wanting her to to introduce her to his brother. Her OK, and so 
they weren't married or anything. They were, they were kind of living together and he was helping her raise her child. And so they introduced them. And once they introduced them, suddenly they connected to the point that they got married way before my niece and her husband ended up getting married. So the grandchild, she, she was like, you know, trying to figure these things out because this was her uncle and her grandfather at the same time. Right. And, um, and I, the reason I think it's funny is because the, the label thing is because my, my sister was pushing her in the cart in the grocery store one day. And I don't remember how old she was, maybe three, four or something. And she looked at my sister and she said, do you know what somebody said to me? And she said, what? And she said, she told me that you were my grandmother. And she was just blown away. Grandmother? Because she called her Mimi. Right. And she said, well, I am. She said, no, you're my Mimi. You're not a grandmother. And it, and that one little thing just kind of sent her on this trajectory of, oh, no, this is not right. But, you know, and then as she got a little bit older, she had a, um, a little bit of a difficult time figuring out why this one person could be two things to her, you know? And I know that's nothing to do with your story, but it makes me think <laughs> that as a child and you're trying to figure out, like, if you have a friend come over, you know, this is, uh, this is, you know, it's like, oh. <laughs> it reminds me, there was this, there was this funny movie in the nineties and it was like, there was a song that went along with it. It was like, I am my own grandpa. That's the only part of the song that I live. But it is about like some kind of twisted family, right? Where everybody kind of, you know, there's a plus and minus. Yeah, <laughs> sideways yeah, yeah. It will. It, so I talk about this story and it happened about fifth grade. So just before my biological father returned to my life. And, you know, again, kids in the playground can be a bit nasty. And um, I, I, we were supposed to have this really amazing trip for Thanksgiving. My brother's dad and my stepmom we're going to Hawaii and I was going to get to go with them and my brother. And I was super excited. So I'm bragging at school a little bit, you know, your kids, yeah, whatever, yeah. right. What it's a pretty cool thing to do. Oh, brag today. <laughs> and, and one of the kids goes, well, that's not your real dad. And, and you know, you're like, but you know, you're trying to figure out what to say. And, yeah. and of course my little sarcastic <laughs> fifth grade mind, I said, well, he's really here and my real dad is not. So he's the only dad that matters to me. <laughs> well, that sounds like a pretty damn good response. And, and that really stuck with me at, at such a young age. And, and I was like, no, 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 this is my identity. I'm not going to let anybody else tell me like what my family is supposed to be like. I know who loves me. I know who's here. I know who cares about me. And, and that's all that's ever going to matter to me. And, and I think that, you know, terrible thing <laughs> happening, you know, cause kids are kind of mean. It really just changed my mindset a little bit because there was always this lacking, you know, it's like, oh, why did my dad leave? Why wasn't he here? And I know so many young people feel that when, you know, oh, they're yeah. missing a parent for any number of reasons. Right. Um, and it's really just appreciating the family we have. And it's, it's such a message when, you know, I talk and coach with people is how to not judge those that are not around, but really just try to focus on appreciating the ones that are. Yeah, that that's definitely a gift in any area of our life for any of us. You know, so many people spend so much time thinking about the future or thinking about the past that they ain't even living right here, you know? <laughs> Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So go ahead and take us a little bit further. So how did you get interested in coaching? Because you said, did you say you were in corporate America for a bit? Right? Yeah, I worked in Silicon Valley for 20 years. Um, what did you do? And um, I was in finance. And so I started in kind of core finance roles, revenue recognition, accounting, very exciting, blah, blah. Everybody's asleep now. <laughs> Um, but what I realized, um, especially being in Silicon Valley, is a lot of the technical tools that we used for, you know, the different services that we were doing were actually not that great. And I'm like, why do we have such a great product for our customers and our internal tools are terrible? So I started creating departments where I would go work with the engineering teams to improve the internal tools and processes for finance and the other groups. So at some point it was like with sales and marketing and, and other associated groups as well. So it created an amazing career where I started in finance, but
but essentially built all well, these other things that the color company exists. Because that is impressive. Go ahead. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> No, it's perfect because this is it. You know, sometimes people are like, oh, well, I have to apply to this job and I'm going to do this job to the best of my ability. And I, again, because of my upbringing and because of all the chaos that I had, I was like, okay, that's all right. And I can master that in about five minutes. But what I really like to do is this, this is more interesting. And I just went and pitched it as if it was a business, you know, a business plan. And I came up with the ideas and who needed to be a part of it and what we were going to get out of it. And I was able to do it. And so I just did that over and over again at lots of different companies. So I created a niche of, of jobs that kind of didn't really exist before that. Wow. Wow. Very cool. So how did you go from that to, cause you're not coaching people to do that. You're no. Right. And what I really wanted to do was public speaking. So I, I, okay. even when I was in school, I did a lot of public speaking again, speaking out against bullying. When I left middle school and went to high school, I went back into a lot of middle schools and was kind of teaching against that. Um, and I started playing sports and sports was such a huge part of, again, building that camaraderie. And so when I graduated university, um, I actually started coaching volleyball again. And so that was kind of my first foray into coaching. And what I realized is that coaching was also building up mindset. It wasn't just the physical aspect of playing the sport, but how important those mindset pieces are to really overall success for a lot of people. So I started reading lots of mindset books and sports mindset books and everything in between. <laughs> Yeah. And I opened up my first business. So in 2009, I opened up Purple Turtle Events. And at the time, I was really big into endurance sports, marathons, triathlons, all kinds of things. And I decided um, I wanted to go coach people in that. So again, doing this mix of mindset for these very difficult physical endeavors, while also coaching them on the physical aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I did this while I still had my corporate job because my ex-husband at the time was like, oh no, you're the breadwinner. You can't just go quit your corporate job and open a business. You need to figure out a way to do both until this is profitable enough, you know? Um, so that was a fun journey of trying to do that. And I know so many entrepreneurs do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, to me, it's like I'm an entrepreneur and I've been an entrepreneur forever, but um, I have more than one business and it's like each one of those businesses is what, you know, takes care of my livelihood and, you know, what, I don't know what's going to happen as things go. And so I'm, um, I have learned to just kind of release that it's going to happen, however it's going to happen and whatever is going to take the, the, the front seat and whatever is going to take the back seat, I'm good with it. So, um, you know, I just, I just, I just let it, let it go. And, but it is, it is definitely one of the things that I get a little perturbed about with some coaches, not you, of course, um, <laughs> <laughs> is that some of them give this impression and it may not be their intent. It just may be the way I interpret it. Cause you know, we interpret it through our own little lens. Right. Um, so it may not be what they mean, but I hear them telling people all the time, well, just, just leap, um, do it. And the bridge will appear, you know, burn the boats and all that stuff. And I'm thinking, holy crap. You know, if you quit the job, that's actually feeding you, and then you start trying to create something. I don't see how you could create in such a stressed place. So to me, it's the best gift in the world is to have your, your day job, your corporate job, whatever it is, while you're creating something else. It's a level of um, just knowing that I've, I'm not stressed and having to do things in a way that's not congruent with what I want to do. Absolutely. And think about this time. It was about to, it was a recession, right? The housing market is crashing. Uh, there was tons of layoffs in the company and we did a big restructuring and I got a new boss and a job that was completely boring. And so honestly, like I was working 50% of what I was ever doing before on some of the other bigger projects. So I was like, okay, well, this is kind of flatlined. Let me see what I can do with this extra time and energy that I now have. I'm still knocking it out of the park at my job, but it's just not 
as demanding as it was before, which was perfect because opening a job, opening a business during a recession, it gives you that ability to like figure some stuff out and get through mm -hmm. the tweaks and, and be able to take off. And so it was a wonderful thing to be able to have that transition. But the thing is, I ended up doing my other job so well, they offered me a new position <laughs> and I ended up at the time I was living in Miami, I had to move back to California to go take the new job, but it was a lot more money. And I said, you know what? I wonder if I could just still keep running the business. People in California do triathlons. It's not just Miami. Yep. So I kept the business running across three states, Miami, moving to California. After that, they moved to me to Nevada. I, I coach people all over the country. It really didn't matter. I was able to do virtual training plans and mix it all up and I kept the business running for a long time. So it was fantastic that it taught me a lot about business and gave me that foundation while still having that stability of the corporate job at the same time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, I took a, um, I did a workshop with, oh gosh, her name is Suzanne. I don't remember her last name, but she's a, um, a coach that um, helps people to be speakers. Right. And one of the things that she says all the time is keep your day job. It's, um, it's the best. How does she put it? It's something about it's the the payment plan. You know, they're paying you to keep working on this job that you're this business that you're wanting to um, create, you know. So um, and, and, and I love that. So um, as you're you're traveling all over, I'm very envious of that, too. Um, so, <laughs> so the, the thing is, is that you, you, you're traveling, you're still, you're growing this business and you're just loving life. So you pivoted from there and what created that pivot? Yeah, well, during the pandemic, like many people, it was just a cascade of things that were happening leading up to that before. So I was in Singapore for a business meeting. And after that, I was ironic going to Hawaii on vacation. <laughs> with <a friend. laughs> And so, you know, I'm with all my, my co workers in Singapore, we're having a great time, we have a great meeting. And I'm feeling really good about my job at a, a different company than kind of where I started. And so I go, you know, my friend and I are hiking around Hawaii. We're having a great time, you know, enjoying time on the beach. And all of a sudden one of my coworkers calls and, and that's not like them. That should have been a real crisis before they're bothering me on vacation. I just saw them, you know, a few days before. Right. And she's like, I really don't want to bother you on vacation, but they just hired a new manager for us and you're not going to like who it is. <laughs> So it was like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, well, Debbie Downer here. Go ahead. And, and she's like, I just want you to process this before you get back because he's going to tear apart the team. He's already said that. He's going to completely restructure everything. So enjoy your vacation because it's not going to be fun when you get back. <laughs> so would you have rather her not said anything? Absolutely not because I got off that phone and for the first time, all I said was, well, I guess I can quit now. <laughs> <laughs> like in, in a moment's notice, because what I realized is I had stayed in that job too long. I was already ready to go do something else, but I felt an obligation to my team, the people oh. that worked for me, my great boss that I was working for. And by this shift, knowing that all of that was about to blow up, it just gave me this immediate piece to make that very quick decision of it's time to leave and you need to figure out the next plan. And so I was able to start planning that next transition before, like, you know, I even shook hands with him for the first time. <laughs> oh, wow. Perfect. Perfect. So then you, um, you left that job. Um, well, before you left the job, what did he say when you told him that you weren't going to stay? Oh, well, so him and I botted heads for about six months. It was a pretty awful experience. He made me cry. He made my employees cry. He made wow. me fire people. Um, he destroyed all of like what we had spent five years building. Um, even people more senior than him were afraid of him. It was really kind of an absolutely toxic, disastrous situation. So every day I was just you know future forward. But remember, the pandemic's also happening in this. And so I was had moved to Chicago. <laughs> I lost my apartment because my lease was up. The shutdown is happening. We go from traveling all over the place to <laughs> working from home. And he was a pandemic denier, basically saying this was all going to be done in a week. Tell your team to just keep working as if nothing had happened. And, you know, just I don't want to hear any bitching and moaning and complaining. <laughs> wow. 
Wow. Is he eating his words today? <laughs> oh my goodness. So, you know, it was just like more and more evidence like every week. So every time the most like next ridiculous thing that would happen, you know, between us was just like more and more like, okay, we spend less energy here. We spend more energy on the future. Where are we going? What are we doing? And magically fate put me on a path to cut my expenses, you know, really have a you know, bad or good for the pandemic, but it was just like, oh, okay, all of a sudden, instead of spending this much on rent and going out to dinner and, and all these things, it was like, no, 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 all this is going in the future bucket of where Nikki's going next. So it was exciting. Uh, so where were you living? You said you lost your apartment. So I had lost my apartment and I was like, should I go back to California? And my parents are like, don't come to California. It's way more locked down than where you're at. And I had met a wonderful guy here in Chicago. At that point, I was separated from my ex-husband and we were splitting up, which was, again, difficult during the pandemic. And so I ended up moving in with him temporarily what was supposed to be until everything opened back up. Um, but our relationship ended up working out. We've now been together for, for four and a half years. So, nice, nice. so it, things again with fate were really pushing me not just professionally on a certain path, but personally as well. It was like, no, 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 we're not doing this life anymore. We're not doing these things. And I don't know how loud fate needs to scream at me, but <laughs> sometimes it's a baseball bat. You got to listen before then. Right. <laughs> And, and at first I was still applying to jobs. I was still getting recruiter calls. You know, people wanted me to come work for them, you know, here in Chicago or go back or, you know, but with the pandemic, a lot of things got put on hold and it was so fantastic because once again, I said, no, let me get a career coach and let me sit down and figure out what I am going to do next because I feel like I'm just jumping to the next thing out of habit. And the career coach took one look at me and he was like, you do not want to be in a corporate job. You do not belong there anymore. You need to build your own business and you need to do your own thing and, and you need to really harness what you are and go out and do that. And so I spent an entire month with him really just soul searching and deep diving and figuring out what this next thing could be so that it wasn't just good for me, but that I was really leaving a legacy and helping the people that, you know, just like people had helped me so many times throughout my life. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Beautiful. So as you, you work with this coach and you're trying to figure out this new you, so where did that inspiration come from to create this? Like you've got the podcast, you've written a book, you know, you're a coach. So that's a lot, you know, of stuff. So how did it all come about? Yeah. So the first thing I did, of course, like many people, right, is you start to journal and and going back through even previous journals, too, is just like, when was I the happiest? What were the things I loved doing? What were the parts of my corporate jobs that I enjoyed? What were the parts I didn't enjoy, you know, and didn't want to do when I owned my business? What did I like about it? And it was summer. It was beautiful. Pandemic, everything was closed. So I got on my bike. I rode. I went to the pool. I swam. It was fantastic. I had all this time to think and I didn't have all this stress of work holding me back from building that creative vision of what it looked like. And number one was public speaking. I was like, no, no, no. I want to get up on stages when the world opens up again. I want to get out there and, and just talk to people and really help them and inspire them to do things differently. But as we know, the pandemic didn't quite open up as quickly. I uh, know. And so those journals, uh, someone said, hey, you know, the best way to build your speaking business is to have a book. And, you know, so if you have a book, then you have kind of a platform and people can read more about you. And so the journals became my first book. I, I put them together in a way to build the platform, but also to tell the story of why. Why are we doing this and, and what is it all about? Um, and I just really ended up loving writing. I got into a great community here in Chicago of writers and just kept writing. And it, it got easier and easier. And I write both fiction and nonfiction. So sky's the limit. And then the stage thing. Again, stages weren't open. So people were like, well, you know, a good way to kind of not, you know, worry about the stages, get on podcasts. <laughs> so I started getting on podcasts. And then someone was like, well, why rather than just be on people's podcasts, why don't you have a podcast? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and this is the great way that things can happen when you have that ability to really be creative and just evolve as things are happening, that sometimes you don't have to have this ultimate plan of like everything gets locked out, you know, just try things. And in that first year, it was great. I tried some things and then I sat down at the end of the year and I was like, did I like doing podcasts? I did. I actually really love it. 
did I like writing? Oh, heck yeah. I love writing. Do I like editing? No, but I don't like writing. <laughs> That's why yeah. I don't edit my podcast too. <laughs> you know, did I like motivational speaking? Yes. Again, you know, a little frustrated that it wasn't on stages, but that was out of my control. So it was great to just kind of sit back. And I do this every year um, is really just kind of like, what are all the cool things I tried? What were the things I liked? What were the things I didn't? And then you figure out what resonates, what people resonated with as well as potential mm -hmm. paying clients. Yeah. And then you go forth with those, right? And put some of the others on the back burner. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I talk to people all the time about the fact that, you know, we typically, we create some kind of goal in our mind of what we want to do. And then we start trying to figure out exactly how that's going to happen. And we will resist new things that are coming to try to send us there because that doesn't look like what we thought, you know? And so you're a perfect example of that is, you know, it's a, it's a ebb and flow of all kinds of things. Sometimes it's a deep dive and a back up, and, you know, and I'll say that's the way my life has always been, you know? And so it's like just let it be and be open to receiving some kind of new inspiration, some new ideas, some new people um, coming into your space. And I, and I will share my podcast. I started it because I felt like most of my life I had filtered my voice because, you know, you know who you can talk to about this and who you can talk to about this and who you can talk to about that. And so you become whoever you need to be with the different people. And and you know that, well, you don't really know because you don't want to test it. But you think if I talk about this, they're going to think I'm a Looney Tune and it's going to cause up. So you just learn. And I would have done that my whole life. And so, which most people, I really feel like they do. And I wanted to have a voice that I didn't have to filter. And I thought, now, how can I do that? So I listened to somebody's podcast and I thought, oh, they said the F word a lot. Hmm. I bet you if I had a podcast, I could, it's not that I intend to say the F word, but I could say whatever the hell I want, right? And, um, and I say, I say the F word sometimes, I'll be honest. Um, and then, but then I got tied up with, ah, oh, like, I don't like the tech stuff. Right. So it just seemed like it would be this big daunting task. So I did a, um, the Stacy Lauren had this do the thing challenge podcast, create a podcast on Facebook. I thought, oh, I'll do that. Cause she gave you daily dares of things to do to create the podcast. Well, I just created this podcast with her help. And it was like, wow, I love this. And the more I had guests on, or I even get on sometimes and just talk myself more, it's more guests now than just me, but I love sharing people's stories and, and discovering the different things about people. And it's like, you know, some people can take like your childhood. Some people can take that as an excuse for why they can't do things. And so I'm always blown away with the people that everything in their life was something that pushed them toward a better life. And so I applaud that in you because, you know, you know, everybody can find they can either have one opinion or the other and they get to choose. And some people choose to see the bad and that's just who they are and they can just be all that all they want to. But the thing that was interesting to me as I was going through with my podcast was that I had I had hired a business coach and my business coach told me that I had to let the podcast go because I, he said I was I was split in too many places. And I said, wait a minute, the podcast is my self-care. This is where I get to speak and I get to be and I get to ask questions. I get to interrupt people and they can't say anything. I get to do all of this stuff and I get to share people's stories. I'm not giving this up. And it was when that happened that I realized how much my podcast means to me. And, and I'll have people all the time ask me, well, how much does it pay? Nothing. And I love it. You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, and I always point out the fact that, you know, the podcast community is really tight, no matter what your podcast is about. Mm -hmm. And and I always say it is a fantastic networking tool. You know, you get a chance to have a real conversation with someone about a certain topic. And you usually only put people on your show that you resonate with that you would yeah. want to hang out with anyways. And then you never know. I've done so much business with different people in my podcast, and I continue to support their stuff. They support mine. And it's fantastic. I think people that think of a podcast as transactional is like, okay, I just got to get on as many guests as possible. And I got to get so many views and so many followers. And blah, 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 blah. I was like, you're missing the point of mm -hmm. like what this is really about. And not everybody's going to be that. And again, oh, okay, you're going to get a whole bunch of million dollar sponsors. And this all of a sudden becomes your day job. Cool. Maybe if you're a true crime podcast or something, but yeah. you know, for the rest of us, we're just trying to be inspirational. We're just trying to make real connections and just gives people something else to do besides listen to the garbage on the radio. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, 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 they're like meeting you. And that would not have happened if there hadn't been a podcast involved. And I have got such amazing guests. And I know you feel the same way about your guests. And some of them I've had on, you know, I've won a couple of them I've had on like three or four times, you know, because it's like, we got to keep this conversation going, you know, might as well turn the camera on, you know, <laughs> but it is, it is such an amazing tool that has come out of something that, you know, um, it felt like a, 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 a lacking thing in me as far as, you know, saying my voice, right? But it birthed this amazing podcast that I dearly love. And, um, and I, I don't see it stopping anytime, you know, it has nothing to do with a monetary value. It's just having connections with people. And like I said, I love the, the fact that your story is your catalyst for making these wonderful places in your life. And that is such a beautiful thing. So I'm so grateful that I can dive into this with you. And the thing that I love is I feel like with my podcast, I feel like everybody that's on my podcast is sitting in my living room. We got our, our feet up on the, on the little thing and, and we're sipping our coffee or our tea and we're just having a get to know each other conversation. And it just feels amazing. And, and I love that. That's what other people like about podcasts too. You know, I think so much of other things are so formulaic now and, and there's so much specific stuff going on. And okay, maybe if you like the, the genre of whatever the kind of show is, maybe you're into it, right? But I feel like we just get so inundated with this perfectionist, you know, Instagram perfect life that I think we like being a little more raw on podcasts. We like being a little more original. I think that's why a lot of people enjoy just audio only podcasts too. Mm -hmm. They say it's really more intimate too. People listen to it in the shower or or, you know, while they're cleaning, they can do it in multitask. And it's great for us to have video as the option for people that, you know, maybe have hearing impairments or other options. But I, th I think it really just is a very different medium. And I hope it stays like this, that it doesn't become like so commercial that it's just basically, you know, beiged out like everything else. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, so now, um, do you have a copy of your book? I always have a copy of my book. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, grab it. Grab it. Grab it. Ta-da. Chameleon Mindset. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Chameleon Mindset is uh, not only a book, it's an online course and is also my in-person or, you know, virtual coaching that I do with people. And it's really about embracing change and building mental resilience, whether that is for whatever your professional path looks like, or whether that's for your personal life. If you're having challenges with relationships, family, I definitely have a good mix of being able to share stories, you know, and methodologies for trying to get past some of those challenges. Um, and the book's just really fun. We have Karate Kid style exercises that you can do, not just by yourself, but you can also do them with your family, your partner, um, your kids, even they're very approachable. So I try to make it fun more than like, oh my God, let's talk about all your traumas. And the yeah. worst things that <laughs> let's go happened. into the deep hole and you won't even feel like you can get out. <laughs> That's not Nikki. <laughs> yeah. Me either. Me either. It's like, you Save know, I'm a, therapist. <laughs> I'm a transformational coach and a hypnotist. And there'll be people that sometimes that when they meet with me, they want to start telling me all these things. And I said, you know, I don't really need to know the nitty gritty. You know, let's talk about how you feel about it. You don't have to tell me the story. 
and then let's work from there, you know, but, you know, because people want to relive and relive and relive. And I'm thinking that ain't healthy, baby. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Well, and that's really where I try to make the distinction is like therapists are important and therapists help you work through those things in the past. A coach is here to build your future and, and a really good coach keeps you focused on that. Those things will come up, but it's it's best to leave them back there. And the more you can be really present with who you are right now and how you're feeling and whether it's getting you to where you're trying to be, the better off you're going to be. And, and trust me, I've done plenty of therapy and done the work. So I, I know kind of where I came from because a lot of that could have left me with a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. it, it easily could have. I could have gone a very different direction from any number of those things that happened over those years. Um, it's those decision points where we have to take that step back and go, man, that sucked at the time, but I'm okay now. And here's what we're going to do instead. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like I say in my intro, you know, we, we leave, we live a mosaic life and it's all those pieces, all those little amazing this uncomfortable things that happened in your life created this uh, amazing person that you are today. So one of those things left out, you wouldn't be as amazing. Hmm. Not so good, right? <laughs> we got to take it all. It's not all rainbows and sunshine, man. Right. And, and if it is, you end up with some other kind of challenge later on. So, yeah. you know, I always say it's a lot like training for marathons. You don't want the marathon itself to be your hardest day ever training. You want to train hard every week, every time you want to deal with the rain and the snow and the heat and whatever, and a raccoon running in front of me and all sorts of strange things. <laughs> you want those things to happen while you're training. So that when you get to the real deal, it's easy, it's breezy, you're having a great time and you're smiling. Um, and I think about that kind of throughout every other challenge that I undertake in life. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. I love that. So you coach people in a group or you coach one on one? I mostly do group coaching. I, I find the collective is really an important part. Um, if people have issues that, you know, they want to go a little bit deeper on, I do some personal coaching, but really it's to help each other be accountable um, because I don't want to be the spoke in the wheel that I, I'm right. going to give you the methodology. I'm going to give you the community. I will also refer you to other people in my network if they're specialized in something you're looking for, but you've got to do the work at the end of the day. And the more people that you can surround yourself with to do that work, the better off we're all going to be. And, and I like to have fun. So let's yeah. do it all together. And let's also cheer each other on so that every step of the way, even when you have a fallback, that there's someone there going, no, 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 that was great. You got it. Let's keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Community is amazing for this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, definitely. Um, so what is something that you would like to share with everybody to kind of give them a little, I don't know, maybe a little insight into what you can do for them or, you know, you've already talked a little bit about it, but share a little bit more, give them a little bit better taste of something. Well, I'm not going to make you run marathons if you don't want to oh, run good. marathons. <laughs> I have, Some people do I get walked a marathon, a half marathon. I did a half marathon. And, there you and go. I will share real quick. When I decided to do that, I was very heavy and I was decided I had to do something different. And I couldn't walk from one mailbox to the next without being exceptionally winded. And I trained and I will say I walked that half marathon. Now, of course, I'm not a runner. I was walking. It was a half marathon. But I will tell you, I about cried when that they said it was 13.1 or two miles. I don't remember what it was at that little meeting that we had. I went, oh, what? <laughs> but I'm doing this. And I told my sister, I said, at the end of it, they may be out there. with. And it started at like four in the morning, right? They may yep. be out there with a lantern at night saying, we still got one out, but I'm going to finish it. But, you know, so I did it in four hours, which was um, felt amazing when I got finished. So, but I wouldn't. Well, and that's what I always say. It, the, 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 the race is not about a, it's not the race. It's the distance. It does not matter. There's literally no, like, this is how much time you have to do it in. It's just, you do it. Yeah. And, and a lot of people get worried because, you know, obviously a lot of my background is doing sports and I use that as analogies, but that's not necessarily what I force everybody to do, but we do really fun exercises. We really do community exercises. And right now I'm seeing a lot of people too, like struggling a little bit with their business foundation. So with all my time in Silicon Valley, we're mixing in a little bit of like business foundation work with the mindset, especially pricing strategy. That's where I've spent most of my career what? and a lot of pricing strategy. Okay. I'm, I'm from the South. You talk fast. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, pricing strategy is, um, you know, really thinking about what your price is going to be in the market. And a lot of people that's very closely tied to their mindset about themselves and their mm -hmm. self worth, and their ability to charge. And so we kind of started combining that first piece. And now we're adding kind of some other elements so that we can tackle the money mindset piece, along with properly setting prices for the goods and services that you're going to be selling to your clients. Yeah. Oh, that sounds amazing. I think I don't see it that are, there'd be a person alive that couldn't use that. <laughs> Absolutely not. And this is where all these things kind of tie together is that I love doing the mindset work, but sometimes people just aren't ready. They're so focused on like, I've got to get the business up and running. Yeah. So I got to pay the bills. We'll talk exactly. about my mind so later. Yeah. We tick off the boxes and we try to do it in conjunction. So you're having fun both ways. And I, I've spent a ton of time in working with technology. So I make technology very approachable. It was a big part of my job as well, is teaching non-techie people. Most of these finance people did not want new tools. They did not want the more automated systems. They liked the process they always had using spreadsheets and paper. And you know, So I, I want to really make the tech approachable. I want to make your business easy. And I want you to have the confidence that you can go out and sell what you're trying to sell to customers that need you to support them. That sounds amazing. So since you're a speaker, do you teach them more how to speak to the, to the customers um, to be able to get their point across better? Because let's face it, most of our issues with customers and everything is communication, right? Yeah, absolutely. So a big part of when I was doing pricing strategy was teaching the sales team how to communicate to customers. So absolutely, I do that same type of sales training with small business owners. And so the best part is, it's just like public speaking. You practice your pitch. You practice what people are going to say back. And the more we have this community too, then you have lots of people to say, you know, how they might object to how you did that and maybe how you can say it better. So it's a really fun thing where you can practice your sales pitch, you know, a dozen times within an hour and you walk out more confident in a non-confrontive like thing where you have money on the line. Cause that's right. the other part that always again gets in people's mindset is it's not just that like, oh, I don't want to feel icky and sell things. It's also about the money piece itself. So we start tackling those pieces kind of side by side, doing the business work with the mindset together. Okay. Well, that sounds quite amazing. So for anybody that is looking to connect with you and talk to you about how they can make this part of their lives. So how would they um, connect with you? And, and just so everybody that knows that um, I will be putting all of her links and her to her book and everything. Um, the links will be in the description on, on each platform that it's going to be on. But for those that are listening, you might you can you can go ahead and say it so they don't have to come back and and watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no worries. The best way to find me is at the Nikki Green 360.com. So the Nikki Green 360.com is a one site to rule them all. So you can check out my books, the podcast, there are free gifts, um, anything else that you might want to learn about me. Ooh, what are the free gifts? Social all kinds of cool things, how to use digital tools. Uh, you can get a preview of my course, you can get a preview of my books. Um, and so it allows people to just really self serve however best they want to connect with me. If they want to watch me dance on TikTok, that's open there too. <laughs> well, now I've got to go and check it out. <laughs> I want to see that TikTok dance. I actually have a um, a woman that is in my, um, I have a group on Facebook it's called Make Lasting Change. And there's a, there's a woman in that group um, that has become a TikTok influencer. She gets on, she dances, she talks, she just does all kinds of things. And now people are sending her things to try out and talk Love about. It. And so it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Me, I have a few things on there nothing live. No, um, <laughs> it's not, that's not me right now. I, it might be me in the future. I never will discredit, you know, what, where it could go, but right now, no, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the beauty of having so many options. Again, just like the podcast, right? It allows you to showcase a little bit different part of yourself throughout these different mediums. And that way, that particular person may resonate with you differently, you know, because you on TikTok, I wear silly costumes. Like, who knows what's going on? You know, on LinkedIn, I'm a little more serious. <laughs> yeah. well, okay. Well, I would figure as much. 
All right. Well, this has been so uh, enlightening. Oh, and really quick, I want to make sure that the people are listening. They know that your Nikki is spelled N-I-K-K-I because I, I, I have to spell my name when I tell people how to connect with me for my group because it's Vicky and Poole and both have an E on them. You know, it's V-I-C-K-I-E. And P-O-O-L-E. And, you know, people will spell it all kinds of ways and then they can't find me. So just just a, a quick FYI for everybody. Thank you. <laughs> so is there anything left that I haven't asked that you would really like to um, share with everybody? You know, I, I just I really love connecting with people and and same thing, learning about their stories. Um, so the more people connect with me, we have tons of free resources to get people going in their businesses. So don't think that everything is, again, going to be some hard sales pitch. And, you know, you got to buy, buy, buy. That's that's just not how I operate. I'm not one of those Internet gurus <laughs> that does that. I just want to have fun and I want to help you guys succeed. So, ah, Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I want to leave everybody with one little thing, and it's the best way to predict the future is create it. So what are you creating? And with that, you have a blessed day, and we will see you soon. Mwah.